so welcome to the third and last day of this differential expression bootcamp. Um, I'm actually the last of the bootcamps I've been teaching for three weeks. Woo. <laughs> um, so um, if you go to the website for the speakeasy example, you'll see that uh, we now have a day three information there. Um, and so uh, just like yesterday, you can go to download example data um, and then run the use this command if you want to just download the latest version. Um, if you clone it with git, you can use git pull to download the latest um, files or um, uh, the third option is to manually download um, the latest version of this R markdown document. Um, um, cool. So, um, so yesterday we uh, explored uh, um, gene expression data overall using like principal component analysis, and then um, uh, and then we learned about design matrices. Um, 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 uh, like for example, uh, like um, we made like this app um, yesterday using um, using explore model matrix. Um, really loading. Um, I'll open it in the browser. Um, can see it see better. Um, uh -huh. um, and so we, we saw that like we can use these um, um, this little uh, diagram that is like a two by two table try to find the interpretation of the different coefficients. Uh, right now the plot is being remade because I zoomed in a couple of times. Um, right, so you know, if you want to find the, the interpretation of the green covariate called primary DX control, I like we subtract things. I wanted to mention the one more complicated type of model where like in the design formula, instead of having primary diagnosis plus brain region, if I change the, that plus for an asterisk, um, which is a multiplication symbol, we get a much a more complicated uh, model um, where we now have a, a purple term here called primary diagnosis control column brain regions SACC. And so this purple term, the interpretation of it um, is a bit more complicated and there's a couple of ways you can do it, but like, if you look at the at the top row, we have red and green, and then red, green, blue, and purple, right? So we take the top right and subtract the top left, we're left with blue and purple. If we do the same thing for the bottom row, right? Like take the bottom right where we have red and blue, subtract the bottom left where we have just red, we end up with blue, right? So at that point, the subtraction on the top has left us with blue and purple and the bottom one has left us with only blue. So then if we take the top version and subtract the bottom one, then we're left with only purple. And so uh, this interaction term, right, is, um, uh, is a difference of differences term. Um, so it's a bit more of a complicated term. And I just wanted to mention this because um, interaction models um, um, uh, uh, tend to confuse people and so Hopefully in this way you can see a little bit graphically how how you can get to just purple, right? Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, from yesterday. All right. So let's start working with um, uh, with actually identifying differential express genes. And so for that I'm going to continue using the RNA seq RNA seq one two three workflow, um, and they have a section there about how to remove. Uh, how I have trouble with this word, um, heteroscedacity, I think that's how you say it, <laughs> uh, from the COM data. 
So I want to open that in a new window. Uh, um, let me zoom in so we can actually see this. Um, um, so there's a little bit here of, a, of statistics um, involved. And one of the problems we have with count data, just, such as the one we have from RNA-seq, is that um, there's a dependent relationship between the variance and the mean. Um, um, sorry, I zoomed in too much. Um, um, and so if you use, for example, a negative binomial distribution, which is the one used by HR or DEC2, then you end up with having like a quadratic mean variance relationship, right? Um, so that's part of the properties of that distribution. Um, uh, however, when we're working with Lima, Lima is using linear regression, not the um, uh, negative binomial distribution. Um, um, and so there's this paper from um, Charity Law et al. from 2014 um, uh, from this group in Australia um, um, where they develop a method called WOOM. And so, uh, I mean, I like that name, WOOM. <laughs> but uh, we use it quite a bit because um, this method WOOM actually enabled using the linear regression modeling from Lima, which is quite fast, for count data from RNA-seq. Without WOOM, we wouldn't actually be using Lima uh, for this type of data. And so what this method does in WOOM is that um, um, it like tries to, it fixes really that mean variance relationship using what is called precision weights. Um, and so um, let's look a little bit at, uh, at some, how this actually rep is represented in a figure. So I'm gonna open this in this figure in um, this image in a new tab, just so I can see it bigger. Um, okay. So whenever you run boom, by default, you're gonna uh, boom uh, from Lima is gonna make a plot like the one here on the left. What is this plot showing? So this plot is showing a single dot for every gene or every feature you have. Um, and then it shows on the x-axis uh, like uh, uh, a version of the mean expression for that gene. Um, so it's like the log two of the counts plus 0.05, sorry, 0.5. Um, so this will typically be like log two of the counts per million plus 0.5, uh, but it, where it's the mean counts. Um, for that particular gene across all the samples that we have. And then the y-axis is going to be the square root of the standard deviation. And you're going to typically get a, a red curve that, um, uh, that is a smoothed line um, across, this, uh, uh, across all the genes that, um, that it starts like higher on the y-axis decreases to a point in the middle and then kind of stays flat after that. Sometimes you'll get like, if you, if you didn't filter the lowly expressed genes, you might get something that starts like really low, goes up high, then comes back down. Um, and so um, here there is a dependent relationship between the mean and the variance. Uh, the square root of the standard deviation is related to the variance. And that's because if you have a low value of a mean, you tend to have a higher square root um, than if you have a high, um, than if you have a higher mean value, and so uh, this is an issue um, for the linear regression modeling. And so heteroscedicity. Eh, I messed up that word. <laughs> uh, can someone else say it? Um, hetero heteroscedicity. No. Uh, well, I give up. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to pronounce that word. Um, anyway, so in, in linear regression, uh, uh, there's um, one of the assumptions is that the variance is constant for all the data that you're working with. And so here we notice that the variance is not constant because um, 
you know, it's like we see that there's actually a relationship here. And so, um, um, Womb, what it does is that it's going to try to find this red line over here. Um, and the distance between every uh, gene and the line. And it will use that to adjust the, um, the values, the expression values that we have. And we end up with something like this on the right side that has like mean versus also uh, variance. And now, now we have a straight line here. And that's by design. Um, that's how like the statistics behind Boom are implemented. Um, and now you get like the same variance regardless of the mean expression. Um, um, like, I mean, you might have some outliers uh, um, that are fairly far away from, from it, but like overall across all the genes, um, now we have a, uh, like a unit variance type of thing. And so at this point, we can then do linear regression. Um, and so when we're working with count data from RNA-seq, uh, we want to, and, we, and we're using the Lima package, we want to use the boom function. Um, um, and so that's the, the main motivation behind, behind this method. Uh, there's, you know, we could get more into the statistics later on, but that would be like, or something beyond this bootcamp. Um, um, so let me go back to the bootcamp here. And so now, when, now that we know that we need to run boom, uh, let's actually run it. And so um, yesterday we created the DGE object, which I'll go back a little bit just to revise what it was. Um, that DGE object was a DGE list object from the edge R package. Um, and we made it because we wanted to use the function calc norm factors for normalizing the RNA-seq data. Um, uh, so that's one object that we made yesterday. The other object that we made yesterday was the mod object, which is the output from our model matrix function that defines our design um, model that we want to use. And so we decided to, uh, we wanted to test the, the differences among um, cases and controls in uh, bipolar cases versus control individuals. Uh, but we want it just for the brain region. And that's because we saw earlier in our exploratory plots that brain region had an important effect. Um, um, and so we want to adjust for it in our regression. Uh, we can adjust for all the covariates and like, um, um, and so like the, the, the actual model can get more complicated in like a real data set. Um, like if you're interested in, in like a much more complicated model, like Luis can at some point tell you a bit more about the MDB model that we're currently fitting, which has a lot more terms on it. Um, um, uh, but like the base, the, the, the rest of the code stays kind of similar. Um, and so after that, those are the two objects that we need to run the boom function from Lima. We need this DGE object and that mod object. Um, and so we'll save that output. Um, and so uh, here Josh chose to call it a V gene, um, lowercase v for boom, and then gene, because uh, potentially we, we might be doing the same type of analysis at the gene level, exon level, exon exon junction, et cetera. And so here we can see this, our um, uh, room mean variance trend uh, plot that shows the x-axis here, we have a, um, a mean expression across uh, for each of the genes and the y-axis is related to the variance. Um, and so uh, you can see that the red curve starts up high, goes down and then kind of stays flat. Here we see uh, the, the full like cloud of black points the like, there's a little bit of like a little tail here, right? That it starts low and then goes up high. And so this is kind of what I was saying earlier. And you, this, um, uh, the piece over here, like, let me see if I can use the zoom annotation. Um, um, yeah. So like, like you might, if we didn't filter out the lowly expressed genes, you might even be, um, start further low, lower. Um, um, so this is a common looking plot, right? Uh, um, and 
typically most of the cloud of the points will be along the red line. In this particular scenario, there's like a, a couple of genes over here that are farther away. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it because it's just a handful of them. But uh, if you saw like two clouds of points, let's say one over here and then one along the line, then that might be more uh, troublesome. Um, um, uh, but I, I, mean, I have never seen anything like that. Um, all right. Mm -hmm. Closing annotations. And so, uh, uh, after running Womb, we have removed the heteroscedacity eh, from the data. Um, and so at this point, we can actually start to, uh, to run our statistical tests. Um, and so now we can actually run linear regression. But uh, um, linear regression has um, another assumption, that is that the samples that we're looking at are independent. Um, and so that's an assumption that is frequently broken in our, uh, in our data sets. Now, why is that? That's because we have um, samples from the same brains, right? And so, uh, like, it's, uh, it would be really weird if the gene expression, let's say, on the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex um, for a given brain, for a given individual, was really different there compared to the uh, hippocampus, right? There are gonna there are gonna be some relationships because there is the same individual, right? Um, and so they're not going to be independent. Um, and so in a lot of our objects that we generate, um, we have a column called the BRNUM column, that is the brain number column that specifies the, the individual or the donor where the brain was derived from. And so here I'm doing like a, a nested table of tables. Um, and that way we can see that we have 36 unique brains and then we have um, um, two uh, situations where that same individual is used twice. Um, and so like two by two, that's uh, equals four plus uh, 36 times one. Um, so that's uh, 36 plus four, that's equal to the 40 brains that we're working on. And so in this particular case, we do have a few um, duplicated um, brains not that many, just a little handful. Um, um, but um, 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 so like some of the code that we'll run uh, next won't actually really work in this scenario because it's very few duplicated brains. Um, uh, but we have more duplicated brains than, uh, than the next code will be really useful. And so the code that, uh, that Lima has that enable us, enables us to handle um, uh, non-independent data. So this could be like duplicated brains, like what I'm talking about, but it could also be, um, uh, let's say a batch effect variable. Um, um, and so this is maybe something like uh, that uh, uh, we could consider in some situations. Um, um, if there's a strong batch effect, we could try to adjust for it using this duplicate correlation. And so the way this function works, duplicate correlation, is that you have to give it um, a matrix of expression. And so we created this B gene object earlier on. Uh, that was the output from the boom function. And when you run boom, it actually stores the expression um, uh, that is like that the one, you know, that we, we can use later on for our analysis under the dollar sign E uh, element of that object. So we'll extract that expression there. We'll use again our design model called mod. And now we're gonna introduce a new argument that is common across uh, Lima functions called block. So this blocking um, argument has to be um, a factor or a, uh, or a character of the, where we have one element per sample in our data set. Um, um, so actually here, this code is wrong. I messed it up. Um, 
uh, here I'm blocking by sample ID. It should actually be the BR num. That's probably why it didn't work. Hmm. All right, I'll fix that. Uh, uh, so we should be uh, blocking here by BR num. Um, so let me actually uh, do that locally on my code here. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah. Let's see if that uh, actually fixes this. Um, I didn't notice that mistake before today. Uh, um, let me fix it for later. So this is kind of small. I'm going to make it bigger. Um, so this function duplicate correlation would actually take a little bit of time to run, as you can notice right now. Um, and so um, what this will do is that it's going to estimate a, um, a correlation um, um, across the um, the samples inside each of the blocks. Um, and so I made a mistake earlier because I was blocking uh, through a variable that is completely unique. That's why I got a result that was not a number. Um, um, but uh, while this runs, I'll explain the next uh, set of functions. Um, so here I made a mistake. I thought it wasn't useful. It might actually be useful. We'll see in a little bit. But the idea is that the next steps after uh, we run duplicate correlation, which is like not um, necessary unless you have um, duplicated samples or a very strong batch effect. Um, 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 and so the next set of functions the, uh, from Lima that we're gonna use, we almost always use them in the same, without like changing much uh, um, uh, arguments to them uh, and you know, almost like basically like use them in a nested way um, where we don't necessarily need to save the intermediate output files uh, or objects. So the first, function, the first function that we use in this trio of functions is the lmfit function. That is a function that is actually going to run all the linear regressions. Uh, or if we're using duplicate correlation, in that case, it will run something called generalized linear regression. Uh, which is a little bit, uh, it's uh, more computationally intensive, uh, but that's what we need to run for uh, complicated um, projects. Then the next function is called eBase, which runs a, a, an empirical base step. And so this is a step where we can then uh, start to get like t statistics and p values out of our, uh, out of our model. Um, um, and it does it in a way that if you have very few samples, um, you'll have more precise um, uh, statistics than if you were to use the regular linear regression functions from R. Um, so that's like this function, actually these two functions are why Lima like early on in like the beginning of the 2000s became such a popular package for analyzing um, uh, microarray data at, at the beginning. Um, and that's because a lot of micro experiments were very expensive at a time and they had very few samples per group, just like uh, RNA sequence um, is also, you know, like that uh, for um, in, in general, right? Um, um, at the Liberty Institute, we have some data sets that are quite big. But that's, um, I would say, it's kind of, still kind of rare in the RNA seq world. Um, and so, eBase computes a lot of things, returns a complicated object, um, and most of you won't actually be working with the output from eBase directly. Most of you will be interested in, in the output from the function called top table. So top table is a function that will extract information from the eBase output and return a table that we can definitely like share with our uh, collaborators. Um, 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 and this is gonna be the table of our differential expressed genes. Um, so 
The way I'll run it here below, I'm actually going to use some of the non default arguments. In particular, if I'm running LM fit, I'll reuse the correlation and the block arguments. Um, oh, cool. Ooh, 0.6. Um, sorry. That is actually higher than I thought it would be. Um, um, but I will change actually the, the model here. Um, cool. Um, okay. So one of the arguments is correlation. Um, and that will be uh, this, uh, the output from our duplicate correlation um, run. Here, um, uh, we saved it as, ah, I don't know where I clicked, sorry. Um, let me go back. Um, yeah. Uh, we're gonna save that output of duplicate correlation into an object called gene underscore dupe core. And so, dollar sign consensus dot correlation. That is what we need to feed into LMF into the correlation argument. The next thing we need to do is we need to specify the block argument argument, just like we did in duplicate correlation. Um, and here I made that. I mean, um, this code that you're looking at here uh, has a mistake, right? Where instead of sample ID, it should be BR num. Um, so like, um, I'll actually just. Um, uh, um, um, I'll share the changes in the break. Um, I love those, I love those changes. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, LM fit here, we're gonna use that correlation argument and that block argument, which are non-default arguments. And that's because we have duplicated brains in our scenario. Um, then eBase, I'm gonna run it without specifying any of the arguments. So um, um, uh, we don't need to dive into that function at all. But then top table, this is the function that uh, you actually might wanna uh, get more familiarized with um, because depending on the options that you specify here, you can get really different things. And so the main argument for top table that you need to get familiarized with is the coef argument or coefficient. And so this has to be a number or a set of numbers and it's gonna specify the column uh, in, from our model, from our design ma uh, uh, matrix that we wanna test. And so uh, let me move away the zoom stuff. Um, so in the model that I have right now, there's three columns, the intercept column, the primary DX control column, and the brain regions SACC column that we like previously explored using uh, the, uh, the package explore model matrix. And so if I'm interested in differences between uh, controls and bipolar individuals, keeping the brain region constant, I'm gonna be interested in the second coefficient. Um, and so that's the case for us right now. And so, here I'm gonna specify coef equals two. Um, uh, there might be scenarios where you're interested in more than one coefficient at a time. And so if you use more than one coefficient at a time, this function top table is actually gonna compute F statistics instead of P statistics. Um, so that's why this uh, coef argument is pretty important to get familiarized with. Now, the name of the function top table uh, should be a hint because it indicates that uh, we're interested in um, in, uh, in finding the top differential expressions. But a lot of times we actually want to share the differential expression statistics for all the genes that we have, right? And so in that case, we're going to use a couple more arguments from the top table function. And so one of them here is that we're going to say that we want to keep um, all the results because you can specify a p-value filter. You can say like, oh, I only want the results that have a p-value less than let's say 0.05, right? Um, and so that could be a filter here. Um, by default, the function top table sorts the data. Um, so I'm gonna say here, here like sort by none. Um, and by default, it also filters the data. So here we can say like how many genes do we want? So the default I think is just 10 genes, the top 10 genes. So here we can say like, oh, actually we want all of them. Um, remember that the rows in our range summarized experiment object specify the number of genes that we have. 
And so we do that here, our object here, uh, our result from top table, we assign it to the object out gene uh, duplicated. Um, and so that final table that we has, that we created has 26,000 rows. That's because that's the number of genes that pass our expression filter and 16 different columns. Um, so uh, below, I'm gonna run top table again, just specifying the quef argument, just so you can see a little bit of how it would look by default. And because I zoomed in too much, it's kind of hard to see. To see. <laughs> um, I'm actually gonna remove some of those columns that are not needed. But like, um, let me zoom out a little bit, see if that works better. Um, right, doesn't really, um, uh, it doesn't look good here, but um, let me uh, run it on my, on my actual code. Um, um, and so in this table here, we have um, the gene code ID, um, the, the gene type, which is a lot of these top 10 genes are protein coding genes. We have two long known coding RNAs. Um, and this like, if, you, if we're looking at poly A RNA seq data, we normally wouldn't expect to see long coding um, RNAs pop up because of the poly A selection step. But uh, this particular data was generated with ribo zero. Um, with a ribo zero protocol. So that's why we can have data for low known coding RNAs. Next, we see the, the gene symbol that we had in our um, uh, gene annotation. So, I mean, I actually don't know anything about the genes. Um, that's why we, <laughs> we work as a team with people that know what these genes do. Uh, um, and some of the other columns are uh, typical output from Lima. In this case, for a T statistic, is the log fold change. So this is how uh, how much expression is changing between um, bipolar controls and sorry, but uh, controls and bipolar cases. Um, this average expression is the mean expression across all the samples. The T column here is the T statistic. So a value that's either like pretty far away from zero, so like a negative five or a positive five, will have a very small p-value. Um, and so right now I ran it with the default options, so that means that it's showing me the, the top genes, so the ones that have the smallest p-value. So here we can see that the top gene has a p-value of, of nine to 10 to the negative minus six. Um, so it's pretty small, but, um, but because we're doing a lot of statistical tests, we actually compute an adjusted p-value for the statistical test that we're doing. And so uh, we can notice here that like the top gene there has a FDR of 0.12. The next one has an FDR of 0.05. So that's because we're working really with an example data set. Um, um, and also with a, with a type of um, disorder where there are maybe not that many differences. Um, um, and so you might normally just uh, filter for the genes that have an FDR less than 0.05 type of thing. Uh, so that is a lot of like results and a lot of numbers and it can be a little bit confusing. Um, and so um, what we typically like to do is to visualize those differential expressions or DEGs, that's the acronym. Um, and so there's a couple ways to do that. So on this peak easy example, I'm gonna open that um, on a new tab. Um, uh, uh -huh. um, um, Josh here made a couple of box plots that show the, um, the, uh, the expression on the y-axis. And we have two box plots, one for the bipolar cases, one for the controls. Um, and so, we can see like, okay, is this, you know, does this difference look believable to you? Yes or no? Um, um, uh, and so that's our top differential expression with a p-value of uh, uh, minus six in that case. 
this is a slightly different um, uh, statistical model than the one I ran. So that's why the results are, are different there. Um, but you know, that's how we can see that gene. And so we typically make plots like this for all the top differential expressions um, to see like, okay, are, are, do we believe the results that we're getting from the model? Um, so we'll make plots like that, uh, box plots like that. And, um, and we might actually use the cleaning Y function from Jaffe Lab if, if we have a more complicated model, if we want to actually see what the model was looking at. Um, um, and so for a more complicated scenario, we would use this cleaning Y function, um, which help, helps us uh, uh, remove the effect of some covariates in the model. Um, I'm gonna zoom in a bit more. Um, um, all right, so that's not one type of visualization we would make. The other one is a heat map. And so there's a lot of heat map packages, but like P heat map, which stands for pretty heat map, that's where uh, we like to use it here. Um, and so a heat map it can be useful to see how, um, you know, like, do the differential expressions, the top differential expressions have to a similar like expression pattern, uh, or maybe there's some like subgroups of them. Um, and so in order to actually make that plot, we'll use a peak heat map package here. And we're gonna look at the output that we created uh, from top table. So if I scroll back up, we saved the output of our top table into an object called outgene uh, duplicated. Duple, duple. Um, so here, just to have some genes to work with, we're gonna select the ones that have a p-value less than 0 0.005. Although normally like you might like select the ones that have an FDR less than point, um, 0 0.05. Ooh, I made a 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. I, I missed a couple of zeros here um, in the comments. Um, um, so that will be like our list of significant genes. And so uh, if we go back to our womb object, the womb gene object, dollar sign E, that's where the normalized expression uh, is saved. And so we're gonna extract those significant genes that we wanted to um, look at. And so we'll extract the expression. Um, and so that will be the numbers that we're gonna use for our heat map. Uh, but then like we might, we wanna make a, a pretty heat map, right? So we wanna describe what those samples are. So we'll look at the phenotype data that we have for our, our experiment uh, using the cold data function. And so we'll extract the primary diagnosis, sex and brain region. Um, just to have a couple of variables here to illustrate how this works. Um, and so we'll create, we'll save that as a data frame. And so we've, we've been doing this quite a bit, right? Like taking the cold data object and, and saving it as a data frame. Um, yesterday, some of you used the pipe uh, syntax for creating the data frame uh, from uh, the cold data. Um, but in this case, uh, once we have that, because we want to show them the names of the genes and stuff and to make them a little bit easier to read, I'm gonna remove the plate ID that uh, was included in samples, in the sample ID. Um, and instead of showing like primary DX, sex and brain region, capital brain, capital B for brain, capital R, we're gonna use a, uh, like shorter names here. So we're gonna rename them as diagnosis, sex and region. So once we have all of that, we can use our PMAP um, function where we provide expression data that we extracted from the room object. Uh, and then you can specify where you want to like group the rows. So we'll say yes to that. What do you want to group the columns? We'll say yes to that. What do you want to show the row names? So that will be the G names. Uh, so here we have a lot of them. So we'll say no to that. Um, and then you have any information that uh, annotates the columns. And so that's where we'll, we're going to provide our small data frame that we created. And so that's how we can make this heat map over here um, that has region, sex, and diagnosis with color coded. Um, um, and so uh, uh, we can see that most of the genes here, they're grouped by their diagnosis. Um, so the colors here are maybe a little bit hard to see because one of them is like a, um, 
uh, a darker pink and the other one is like a, um, some type of red. Um, um, so we could always change those colors to make them more distinct. Um, um, but you can kind of see now like there's a column of genes here that has a similar type of expression. Um, um, and um, yeah, so this type of plots can see, can help you identify like how are some of those genes related. Um, and well, actually here we're grouping them by the, the samples. So this set of samples are, seem to be related here, um, et cetera. Um, uh, although this group of samples has like lowly expressed genes for this couple of ones that like in the other samples are like a little bit expressed. Um, so uh, having said all of this, um, um, uh, let's do a little exercise. So I want you to run the same model that, um, that we ran, uh, the fixed model using uh, BRNUM uh, instead of sample ID for the duplicate correlation. But I want you to make a box plot um, uh, for the top differentially expressed gene. So you need to find which one is that, which one it is. Um, you need to find the expression data for it. And I want you to plot on the y-axis expression data. And then I actually want to have four box plots. Um, so this is the combination of brain region and primary diagnosis. So I want to have a, instead of what uh, we have over here, where we have two box plots, one for bipolar, one for controls. I want to have one for uh, bipolar SACC, and then one for bipolar amygdala, and one for control SACC, and then control amygdala. Um, just so we can see the effect of the four of the of the two main variables that we're using in our analysis, brain region and primary diagnosis, for that top differential expression. Um, um, so I'm going to put you in rooms, uh, and I'll pause the recording, and let's see if you have any questions before we go into the rooms. Well, so. Uh, Next, uh, uh, Josh Stoltz um, is going to explain to us uh, how to do gene ontology enrichment. Um, and um, Josh is a research associate at Lieber. Um, and actually, today when I was meeting with him about this, I, I was like, "Oh, how do you know about this? How do you, how, about these plots?" Um, so I'm well, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so thank you, Josh. Um, take it take it home. Thanks, Leo. Um, so, as Leo said, my name is Josh Stoles. Um, I'm an associate here. Um, I guess if you like uh, like sports commentary and uh, occasional science memes, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, we're going to be going over gene ontology. Um, so, I wanted to give a brief background here because. Um, I think it was difficult for me understanding what ontology was in the beginning and effectively you, you're creating categories of genes and assigning a, an alleged function to that. Um, and, and this is done primarily through network analysis and, and bench work over time. And then people curate all of this research and form it into a, a more organized fashion that we can just run code over and say, oh, hey, all our genes fell in the neuron pattern. And then the biologists really love that kind of thing. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's more interpretable, right? That's, that's the problem with a lot of what we do is how do we put this on a slide? And so specifically, uh, we're going to be looking at gene ontology. There are other kinds of gene set enrichment you can do, but today I think the most common one is gene ontology. And what that is, is they've compiled primarily three, um, three sets of genes here organized by, by different categories. The first is cellular component, uh, the parts of a cell or its extracellular environment um, molecular function, so the ele elemental activities of a gene or of a product of a gene at the molecular level. 
and biological process, operations or sets of molecular events with a defined beginning and end, pertinent to the function in of integrated living units, cells, tissues, organs, and organisms. Um, so I have an example here. For example, uh, oops, how do I go back? There we go. Uh, cytochrome C uh, can be described by the molecular function term uh, oxidoreductase activity, the biological process term oxidative phosphorylation and induction of cell death and the cellular component term, uh, mitochondrial matrix and mitochondrial intermembrane. So it, it's important to understand here that most genes are gonna fall in multiple categories. Um, and, and that kind of comes into the kind of tests and statistical tests you have to do uh, to find if these specific categories are actually enriched. And so I have, I have the textbook definition here. I'll, I'll just read it over. And then I have uh, a much easier explanation on the next slide. So we, we use a hypergeometric test. And I'll, I'll just read this in probability theory and statistics, the hypergeometric distribution is the discrete probability distribution that describes the probability of K successes in N draws without replacement from a finite population of size n, exactly k objects with that feature wherein each draw is either a success or a failure. In contrast, the binomial distribution describes the probability of k successes in n draws with replacement. So if you'd like, I've linked the Wikipedia here. Um, if you're more of a math person, um, you might get more out of it than I did. Uh, but I think there is a much more simple explanation that we can get by on. And that is the, the core concept here is that we're, we're doing probability without replacement. And so as this relates to our genes, you're never going to get a hit on a gene twice in one gene set. Um, once, once that's there, it's, you've, you've almost eliminated it. And so the example here is that there are five green and 45 red marbles in an urn. Standing next to the urn, you close your eyes and draw 10 marbles without putting them back. That's what replacement here is getting at. What is the probability that exactly four out of 10 are green? Note that although we are looking at success failure, the data are not accurately modeled by binomial distribution because the probability of successes on each trial is not the same. So you, you almost just have to adjust the binomial after each one, because after you take one out, there's 44 and, and so on. And so you can summarize um, the variables on the previous slide as below, but there are R packages that do this for us. And, um, Cluster profiler is the main one. There's others. I don't think they're maintained well enough. So there's one called Hype R that has a lot better graphics, in my opinion, uh, and is a little more user friendly. The issue is uh, it's not as well maintained. And if most people are using cluster profiler, then that's going to be the one that's most up to date. So I figured we would do a demonstration of Cluster Profiler. And um, let me see if I can find. Yeah. So this is in the booklet as well. Um, but Enrich Plot is uh, kind of the, I guess, the graphing package that goes with Cluster Profiler so you can graph your genes. Let me know if I'm going too fast here. Um, so this data we can look I'll just, at. I'll just mention that like um, all of this is also in that bootcamp intro, right? Um, so you can show it on the little website too. Okay. So the gene list I just added here, 
Um, this is just an example data set that comes with um, the package. And the top row here are entree IDs. And the bottom row here is log fold change of the gene. So it's already been normalized down to log fold change. And what we're going to do is just take the genes that have more than two fold change. Now, this was actually really probably something that I used to spend like a day hopping from website to website on. But uh, this is called uh, bitter and it's, it's a useful function. Um, and in gene set, it's important because different, different things you do might need an ensemble. Other things might need an entree ID. And so I think it's good to go ahead from the jump and, and get entree IDs, ensemble IDs, and symbols. So if we do that, we get, and now we have, um, something that can report back if we ever need it um all the gene names we have josh can you uh, zoom in a little bit with the uh, command plus and plus yeah is that enough just do it like one more yeah you know, one more or something so people your, so people can follow your your demo better thanks okay thanks um all right, so here's the main function, right? So now we've got our genes picked out from gene, uh, from gene list to gene. So let's see how many genes we have. Gene, oh. So we have 207 genes, which is about the right number, actually. I mean, this is an important thing is, uh, you don't really wanna do gene set enrichment on like eight genes. And then you don't want to do it on like 5,000. Uh, around 200 is, is kind of, kind of what, at least that's what Andrew taught me. And it kind of works out the best there. Um, when you have a small number, everything that like two of them hit is going to be super significant, but there's only like two genes. And then on the big end, it's like, well, you have like a fourth of the genome in here. So, obviously things are going to be enriched. Um, all right. So for the first argument, you, you input your genes. Um, these are going in as entree IDs. I believe there's an argument in enrich go to switch them between, but they do have to go in as entree IDs gene universe. So this is important. And, um, so you only want to include, the genes that are actually in your study. Uh, it is very rare that we use, you know, all 21,000 genes. So coming back to what we did earlier, uh, the genes we filtered out at, before we did the modeling shouldn't be included in, in gene set enrichment. Um, you should just take the gene names off of the filtered RSE. Um, and so here, that sets the background. And again, if you can imagine that, that jar of marbles that we have, we've now shrank it to say, well, actually these genes were never in our study. So don't put them in the denominator of our equation. Um, the org database is just, uh, this is just a, it's a database that annotates genes. And um, so this will always be the same if you're using human. Um, the ontology. So earlier we talked about um, the three ontologies that, that Go has, and we are using what was CC. CC was our cellular component, right? Um, and you can pick BP for a biological pathway. Oh no. What happened? Am I still recording? Yeah, but uh, uh, you're not sharing your screen. Can you just share, share it again? Yeah, sorry about that. So, yeah, BP stands for biological process. Um, um, right. or, uh, 
British Petroleum, I guess. <laughs> um, BP or MF for molecular function. Or we'll leave it to CC for now. Why does this keep happening? Um, uh, so uh, the P adjust method, so you can use different ones. I, I forget what, what, are, what options there are, um, but I think, what, what is BH? Bonferroni, is that? Yeah, Bonferroni, um, Huckberg, who are the people that yeah. invest with FDR. Um, and then keep in mind, so this is a big issue as well, is um, you'll find as you, as you play with the parameters and enrichment analysis, you get wildly different results. Um, and so I would say it, it's kind of arbitrary what cutoff you pick. Um, just, just keep in mind that you should do that standard so that you avoid um, pressures to cherry pick. Um, so for example, here, we could have just taken the top 200 or 300. It doesn't really particularly matter, but if we took the top 300, that would radically change our results once the output is. And so I, I would just say decide ahead of hand what your parameters are gonna be and, and then kind of stick to them. Um, the last option here is uh, the readable. So this is nice because it gives you um, it gives you gene names because entre IDs aren't really that interpretable to biologists. Um, I, I don't know that I can do anything with the gene names, but for biologists, they like gene names. And so the output here, if we run it, will be, that'll take a minute, but it'll give you a data frame um, that you can then use to create plots and it, it ranks your, your outputs. So if we do head, ego, oh geez, we're too zoomed in here. Oh, I mean, that's not terrible. Okay. So yeah, so the biggest one we got to hit on here is spindle. Um, and then over here, it lists all of the genes that are that were in the data set, um, or not in the gene set um, that were in our in our data is what I mean. Um, and so you can get a table like this, and this is nice to just export to Excel and take the top two hundred hits and kind of put on a slide. But then. Um, I think the next thing is, is to visualize your data. And so this is an, a much easier way of looking at things. Um, this is from the enrich plot. And so we've taken our top 20 hits and put them over here. And now you can, can see much better where the bottom here, I'm trying to move. The bottom here, I believe, is the number of genes in, in the, the gene set that were in our study. And so this is a much easier way of looking at what our, what our gene set is and what's significant. Um, something to be wary of is, is obviously like mitotic spindle midzone. I'd be very concerned because that's only like two or three genes. So, I mean, is that significant or is that by chance um, is you have to be wary of? Um, and then uh, you can kind of visualize a little better with the dot plot, um, where the dot here shows the number of genes and then the color is showing the count. Um, so that's, that's the one that I think most people know about. I'll have that in here twice. So this, uh, the next one I'm going to show you is called a net plot. I don't, 
particularly find it that useful for anything I do. But uh, a lot of people use it in like network analysis and things. It's nice to see how how things are interconnected. Um, so you have to reformat your data first with this set read table. And it, it somewhat annotates your genes for you um, as to what uh, interconnection is happening there. And then you can form a plot like this, which again, for our data, I don't find this particularly informative, but you could imagine if you were doing something like a uh, gene network and drug discovery or something, that or connecting these gene networks and seeing which genes are mediating what might be helpful um, in understanding it. And then lastly, I actually find this plot to be the best. Um, so there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, so what's plotted here are all our gene sets again on the y-axis and on the x-axis are our genes, but it also shows fold change. And this was something I didn't understand for a long time is that um, I guess a gene set could be differentially expressed in two directions, right? And so you, you can visually see here, like the extracellular matrix is, is only showing up because it's actually down expressed. And again, uh, the collagen containing extracellular matrix is only showing up because it's, it's down regulated as well. Um, and that's not something we could have seen with the other plots. The other thing you can see here is there are blocks of genes that are driving a lot of this significance. Um, here and here are dry, these, these genes are really mostly driving, um, driving a lot of our results. And so, I mean, you, you can come to conclusions out of that. Um, I haven't figured out how to cluster this graph yet, but I think that would be really interesting if we could. All right, for now, that's most of my demo. Um, and I do have an exercise for you. The first one is to rerun this analysis and produce the heat plot using our doing biological process instead of, um, instead of cellular component. I guess I'll stop share for a second and see if uh, everyone understands or if we're ready. So this eagle object that we had was a bit complicated because it's like a very specific type of object um, from the um, uh, cluster profiler companion package called uh, DOS. And so uh, Josh was like, oh, just make it into data frame. That way it's a lot easier to work with. So that's what I did here, make it into data frame. And so once it's in the data frame, um, if we look at uh, the column names of it, um, it has one called description. That's where I can see the text. Um, and then another one called gene ID. That's where all the gene IDs are present. And so we can just um, extract from uh, the gene ID column, the one where the description is equal to chromosome, comma, space, centromeric, space, region. And so we get here the list of gene IDs, but they're separated by a forward slash. So I did a little bit of extra work to, to split them. And so now I get the full list here. Um, in a more visible format um, um, for all the gene IDs. Uh, the other solution was, uh, the, other, the other problem was, okay, like, can you run it again, but using the bi biological process ontology? And so that really means running again the rich go function, but only changing the ont parameter. Notice that we didn't change any of the other parameters for p-value or p-value cutoffs or things like that. 
So I ran that and I saved it as ego underscore BP. Um, and then Josh had used uh, set readable. So I used that again um, to create a ed, um, uh, <laughs> had a typo there. Ed, uh, um, I'll call it ego BP underscore X. And so once we have that, then I can run the, um, the um, heat plot function. Um, let me just make it again. Um, and so I saw that some of you also had this uh, plot. Um, let's zoom in so I can see it bigger. Mm -hmm. My computer will let me. Um, oh, it's already here. Oops. All right. Um, so you get something that looks like Tetris. <laughs> That's how it felt to me. Uh, um, yeah, so I'll post the solutions. Um, I'll, so I'll update the document with the solutions for the exercise from today. Um, I was making the solution also for the box plus from earlier. Um, um, both the base R and the ggplot2 version. I still need to tweak a little bit my ggplot version. Um, 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 yeah, so that was it for our course, for our bootcamp on differential expression. Um, it's not recorded on the video, but there were conversations in some of the uh, rooms about like more advanced options, like using, for example, SVA. Um, and um, we do that, we, we use a flavor of SVA for uh, some of our analysis, but um, like, without the structure from like the bait, like, you know, the introduction level material, it's hard to start jumping into all the advanced um, um, methods that we use sometimes, sometimes not, things like that. Um, so let me stop recording. Uh, zoom.